Well, hello and welcome. Easy text today. I'm sure y'all have all figured it out, so we'll just close up shop and go on home. That would work for me. Okay, um, first of all, Astros. Words, World Series bound starting tomorrow. It's going to be great. Wear your orange and blue. It's going to be a great weekend, and we're going to wrap this up before next Thursday because I am out of Astros clothes. Okay, um, so go Astros. Our children have a fantastic lesson uh, today. They are learning, uh, continuing to learn about the story of Joseph. And this week, how Joseph was sold into slavery. Um, His brothers were mad at him. They threw him in a pit. But providentially, God had a caravan coming by. They pulled him out of the pit and took him onto Egypt. And you know the rest of that story. It ended very well for Joseph. And the aim is to teach the children that God will protect them just as he protected Joseph. So it's a great story. Um, Robin and Robin Smith and her core group are back there serving today and we thank them and we um, know that you look forward to your opportunity to serve and get to um, see our fantastic children's program. Okay, I'm going to have Rochelle put up a picture. And this picture is like if you're standing right in front of a painting and you are that close to the painting. You can't tell what that is, can you? So you have to take a step back. You're up too close. And take a step back. And take a step back. And the further you step back, the more in focus this picture becomes until you see the big picture. But when you're right up on it, immersed in the details, you can't tell what it is. You can't figure anything out. So sometimes you have to take a step back in order to see the big picture. Ladies, there is a big picture in Scripture. And prophecy plays a huge role in allowing us to see that big picture. As we look at end times prophecy, I think sometimes we can make the mistake of getting so caught up in the minutia and the detail that we miss the big picture. And what I love about today's lesson is the angel encourages Daniel, take a step back and look at the big picture of history. And that's what I would encourage all of us as we go through this lesson today. Perfect example, though, of people wanting to see the, the details. I, if I ask for you to raise a hand, many of you came here today. Some of you mentioned to me as you walked in the door this morning, I hope you have the answers to what's going on in this text. We want to know the answers. We want to know who are the horns, who is the little horn, when is this going to happen, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Please don't get me wrong. Of course we need to try and search for answers and try and learn this. But I want to encourage us. If we're in that space where we're searching and we're digging and we're frustrated and we're upset and it's like weighing heavy on our hearts, take a step back and look at the big picture of history. And that's what we see today. In fact, in verse 14 of chapter 7, this is the big picture, y'all. And to him, Jesus, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. So in spite of some of the disturbing and alarming details that we'll go through, that you've already gone through in your lesson, never ever lose sight of the big picture. And the big picture is that God is still and always in control of history. And he wins the battle. So we have, I I love this little saying, all history is his history, is his story. It's his story. It's his love story of redemption for mankind is what history is. So the challenge as we unpack these difficult uh, passages today is will you choose to trust that God is in control of all things as his story is revealed through history. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for these challenging passages of text, but I thank you that you show us how it ends with you on the throne and you in control always. Father, we thank you. Um, We pray that we will see your truth this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so... 
Last week we had the story of Daniel in the lion's den, and we were all thinking, oh, these lessons are kind of easy. This is great, right? And then this week, what on earth? I mean, we're into end times prophecy, and it's like whiplash. Well, are we still in the same book? This doesn't even look familiar to where we were last week, right? Don't worry. If you felt overwhelmed this week, you are not alone. <laughs> we, I think we are all in agreement. This is, can be a little bit overwhelming, but we will go through this this morning. We'll try and, and make our way through and see uh, where Daniel is leading us. Um, three things before we get started. I want you to know up front that scholars do not all agree on how to interpret end times prophecy okay so I am going to teach how I feel like the Lord has led me but please know that scholars differ on the interpretation second thing I want you to do is I can't possibly hit on everything in the next 25 minutes okay so read your commentary it is very very good read your commentary that'll answer a lot of questions and third thing I'll be here if you have some questions I'm probably won't know the answer to it but I can go home and see if I can find an answer to it but come come talk to me if you have any specific questions when we're done okay so as we open chapter 7 you probably realize this is not chronological right because Daniel says this was at the first year of Belshazzar now Belshazzar's already dead as far as we've read chronologically right so if you want to put this chronologically in scripture you can take chapter 7 and 8 pull them up out of the Bible, move them back, and place them in between chapters 4 and 5. That's where chronologically they would fit in Scripture. For whatever reason, Daniel did not organize the Bible, or his book, uh, chronologically. And so where we are, as we open chapter 7, Daniel is a mere 68 years old. Okay, he's a youngster, because last time we saw him, he was in his 80s. So he's 68 years old. He has faithfully served Babylon for most of his life. Um, Belshazzar is new, the new king sitting on the throne. Babylon is rocking and rolling along. The handwriting on the wall that we read about a couple of weeks ago won't even take place for another 14 years. Okay, so that's where we are chronologically. So like, like a flashback. Okay, so remember a few uh, weeks ago when Daniel interpreted King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He saw a statue, right? And we talked about how that represented different kingdoms. But we also talked about how when Daniel had interpreted the king's vision, he was looking at everything through binoculars, right? Because everything was in the future for him. But we said at that time, as we looked at that statue... A lot of that statue is in our rear view mirror. It's history. Everything down to the toes, the the lower legs, the toes, and the stone that was coming in. That is still in our binoculars. But from the head down to the toes is rear view mirror for us. Okay? We're going to use these again today. Okay? So as we open chapter 7, Daniel, again, is looking through binoculars. And he sees four great beasts come up out of the sea. And our lesson did a great job of having you walk through the description of the beast. So we are not going to hash that out. But there was a lion, a bear, a leopard, and a fourth terrifying beast. Now the angel told Daniel that those four beasts represent four kingdoms. Now I've got a chart for us here. We always love charts. Those four kingdoms align perfectly with the four kingdoms from Daniel uh, chapter 2 from the statue okay you see that and we also have chapter 8 we'll get to that in just a little bit okay so as the vision unfolds Daniel can't stop looking at that fourth beast right and it's terrifying it has 10 horns and then as he's looking at it something even more hideous happens a a little horn comes up out of the middle right so bizarre and that little horn has eyes and it has a mouth that has is speaking great things it's creepy right it's kind of this I mean this is right and so 
this is my opinion, um, so take it for what it is. But I think that Dan, the Lord doesn't want Daniel to obsess over what he's seeing, this terrifying, this, these horns coming up. And so I think God allows Daniel to take a step back and take a look at the big picture. And that's why he shows him this next scene, verses 9 through 10. As I looked, thrones were placed. And the Ancient of Days, who is God, took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and his hair on his head was like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. Daniel is seeing, and we are seeing, Judgment Day, as, as is foretold in the book of Revelation. This is the day where we anticipate where God will right all wrongs. Daniel sees God sitting on the throne, and when it talks about his hair is white, that shows the uncompromising purity of God. It talks about his pure wool, his hair. This would symbolize his wisdom, and a wisdom, the only wisdom that is qualified to judge and discern between right and wrong. The fire represents judgment, and his power to pronounce that judgment. His court is now in session, and the books are open, and he will judge the deeds of those whose names are in the book. This is end times prophecy, y'all. So this is all of us are looking through the binoculars. This will come in the future. But what I want us to see, big picture, no matter how ugly some of the details of what we're about to look at, who's on the throne? God. God is on the throne. And he always has been and he always will be. He is in control and his mercy and righteousness will reign forever. But Daniel is distracted. He sees this beautiful scene, but he's distracted. And he turns his attention. What he sees is this little horn is destroyed. And when the smoke clears, the horn is finally quiet. And the terrible beast is dead. And then Daniel sees a final fig figure come onto the scene. This is our memory verse. This is big picture, y'all. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, who is Jesus. And he came to the ancient of days, God, and was presented before him. And to him, Jesus, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. That is the great news. He sits on the throne forever and ever and ever. This scene, verses 13 and 14, John records in his vision, the Revelation, chapter 19. When Jesus comes, returns at the end of the ages and judges and rules the nations. And so with the crown of the kingdom resting gloriously on Christ's head, God has shown Daniel the big picture of history. What a beautiful picture that is, right? But Daniel is rightly confused, <laughs> as all of us in the room are, right? And he wants to inquire more. He wants to get closer. He wants some of those details, right? And so he consults what many scholars think probably an angel, and he says, what does all of this mean? And specifically, he wants to know, what does it mean, this fourth beast, this fourth kingdom? Because it's different from all the others, right? What are these horns? What is this little horn, right? And so here's, here's where it gets really complicated, okay? In one sense, this beast represents the ancient Roman Empire. We had the statue up there, and we know that the, in the statue, it was the legs of iron was the Roman Empire. And we know that Rome came in, and they toppled the Grecian Empire, and Ro the Roman Empire, um, the ancient Roman Empire was 
uh, in control from 63 uh, BC up to 475 AD. Okay? And so this, that part is in our rear view mirror. But here's, here's where it gets a little confusing. This beast, part of the beast is gone too. But those ten horns, which correlate with the ten toes of the statue, this would be what scholars um, refer to as the revived Roman Empire. Okay? And that, for you and I, is prophecy. Looking into the future. Okay? Now, I don't know how the Roman Empire is going to revive itself. I don't know when that's going to happen. I don't know what that's going to look like. But scholars believe this will be some sort of a confederacy or an alliance of ten countries around the world, maybe in Europe, that will come together to form a one world order, something along those lines. And from that alliance will arise a little horn. And when you see horn in scripture, it usually means king or kingdom. So one king, one leader will arise out of that. And that little horn will be the person, Revelation tells us, the person that we know to be Antichrist. Okay? We all tracking? Are y'all like, what on earth is she talking about? Okay. But please know, Antichrist doesn't necessarily mean opposite of Christ, although he is opposite of Christ. I think more importantly, it means instead of Christ. And Antichrist will come to set himself up instead of Jesus Christ. And he will demand that the world worship him and not Jesus Christ. Okay? So the angel tells Daniel that this little horn is going to blaspheme God. He's going to oppress the saints and he'll abolish the calendar and the legal system. But he also tells Daniel that this little horn will only rule for three and a half years. And you're wondering, where did it say three and a half years? Time, times, and time and a half. That means three and a half years. Who knew? Okay. And so he'll only um, be in control for three and a half years. Okay. Now we know from Revelation chapters 13 through 19, at first when Antichrist comes onto the scene, which is prophecy for all of us, when he comes, he will appear friendly. He will come talking about justice and love and peace and prosperity. He will be brilliant. He will be eloquent. I think he will be very well spoken. He will appear as an angel of light, just as Satan often does. And he will be hailed by millions as a superman who has come to save mankind. But ladies, he is a liar and he is a deceiver. Revelation tells us that he will present himself as a peacemaker. So this will be, um, he'll, he'll come in the end times, he'll come and he'll sign. If you've done a study of Revelation, he will enter into and sign a seven-year covenant to protect the Jewish people. But halfway through that seven years, Antichrist will break that covenant and he will set up his own image in the temple, the holy temple of God. And people will, and he will force the Jewish people, he will force all to worship him and Satan who is behind all of it. He will become the ruler of the world. Again, this is off in the distance. And he will not only control the world economy, he will control the world religion. Now, up close and personal, if you're standing there, that's ugly. And that can be terrifying. And it will be a terrifying time for anyone who is living in that day. But the angel, in a sense, allows Daniel to take a step back and see the big picture. And the angel tells Daniel, look, Antichrist's dominion is going to be taken away. And his power will be defeated. And we know that history will climax with the return of Jesus Christ to this earth. And he will defeat Antichrist. And Jesus Christ will establish his kingdom on earth. And that's the big picture, y'all. That's where we have to stay focused. We're halfway through. And if you think this was tough, chapter 8 is going to blow your mind. Okay. 
two years after he has his first vision, he has another vision. And he f sees himself in the city of Susa. Now, it's unlikely that Daniel travels to the city of Susa. More likely that the Lord transports him supernaturally. We've seen this done with Ezekiel when he transported him to Jerusalem. And John, the apostle John, when he had his revelation and was taken out to the wilderness, right? Um, but let's look at a map here. So here's Jerusalem where the Israelites were. They've been over here in Babylon for many, many years, okay? Do you see, I can't reach it, Susa out there? 200 miles to the east is the city of Susa. And this is where the Lord transports him. And this, stay with me here. At this time that he's having this vision, Babylon is still at the top of their game. They're still very much in control. But Susa over there is the capital of Persia. And who's coming down the tracks? Persia is. And so Daniel doesn't know it, but in just 12 years when Persia comes and overthrows the Babylonians, Susa is about to become the next world headquarters, the, the, next, the center of the next world power. Okay, I just thought that was crazy how God has woven that into the story. Okay, so Daniel is shown a ram, has two horns, it's the Medo-Persian Empire. We all figured that out. Or, well, the angel told us, actually. And so binoculars for Daniel, again, rear view mirror for us. And the Medes and the Persians rule for about 200 years. And then he sees a goat come in and battle the ram. And the goat wins the battle, right? Again, rear view mirror for us. This is Greece, we're told, right? That's what the angel tells him. This is Greece. And this horn the king of Greece, we know from history, history books tell us this was Alexander the Great, okay? Alexander the Great, I mean, conquered so much territory. His territory went from Greece all the way over to what we now know as India, okay? Think about that. This is back 300 years before Christ. I mean, this is crazy big territory. Let's look at verse 8 of, of chapter 8. Then the goat, who is Greece, became exceedingly great. But when he was strong, the great horn, who is Alexander the Great, was broken. And instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Okay, again, rearview mirror, history confirms for us that Alexander the Great, he died in two, I'm sorry, in 323 B.C. This is when Alexander, he was only 33 years old. He was a young man. Uh, scholars think he died of alcoholism, okay? But he was a young man. And so when he dies, I mean, he's got this huge empire, right? And so for years, people inside his empire, inside his kingdom, are fighting to take over control of the empire. Finally, after much infighting, Alexander's four generals, the four horns, Alexander's four generals divide and split the kingdom, okay? We have another map here. This shows you the kingdom of um, Greece at the time, and these are the four generals. Cassander had, he, he took what was, we know as Greece. Um, Antigonus took what we know as probably Turkey. Um, Ptolemy took northern Africa, Egypt, and then look at all this green area. Seleucus. General Seleucus has all of this green area. Okay? Keep in mind, General Seleucus. Let's go to verse 9. Out of one of them, out of one of the four generals, came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land, which is Israel. Okay, and now this, ladies, is where prophecy gets crazy precise, okay? It, it, this is so cool. But this is also where prophecy has double meaning and double fulfillment. And what I mean by that is some prophecy, you, it can be fulfilled in the near term, and then it can also be fulfilled long term. Okay, now we've already determined from chapter 7 that that little horn represents antichrist right so that's the long-term fulfillment of this prophecy okay but what daniel is talking about here in chapter 8 he's talking about the grecian empire right and so what we're going to be looking at for the next few minutes is the short-term fulfillment 
of this prophecy, okay? Now, we know, again, rear view mirror, what happens to this kingdom. Remember that um, Seleucus, that he, he, the general Seleucus had that big area? Well, one of Seleucus's descendants rises to power. This is the little horn. He is a man, history tells us, history, but you can Google him. We'll put his name up here. Antiochus Epiphanes, okay? Evil, evil man. But he is, he's all over Jewish history, okay? He ruled from 175 B.C. to 163 B.C. So about 150 years before Christ is born, okay? And he is evil, Okay, I mean pure evil. The Jews referred to him as a madman. I think of him as an ancient Hitler. Antiochus was determined to uh, Hellenize everyone he dominated. When I say Hellenize, I mean to make Greek. He wanted to make them into Greeks. He wanted to strip away all their identity, all their Jewish heritage, and instead make them worship Greek gods and become Greek. And so he's going to start by trying to strip away their religion. Jewish historians note that Antiochus sent his generals with 22,000 soldiers into Jerusalem on what was purported to be a peace mission, but they go in on the Sabbath... And they slaughter not only the chief priests, the high priest in the temple, but thousands of others. Antiochus forbids the Jews to be able to worship their, in, with their feasts and their festivals. No Passover, no Pentecost. Instead, they have to worship the little g Greek gods. He forbids them from observing the Sabbath. He forbids them from circumcising their sons. He forbids them from reading the scriptures. And in fact, um, it says that he had some of the um, sacred books burned. And in Daniel's vision, you read, it says that he sees that the Jew, Daniel sees that the Jews are no longer able to go to the sanctuary and offer burnt offerings. Right? And if you know anything about Jewish history, if you've read Exodus or Leviticus, you know how important those offerings and those sacrifices to the Lord are to the Jewish people and to God. So he forbids them from offering sacrifices. And instead, Antiochus Epiphanes goes in on the altar of God in the temple and slays a pig and takes the blood from the pig and throws it all over the sanctuary, including on all those vessels, those sacred vessels that the Jewish people used in their worship. Terrible, terrible man. And, and he sets himself up as a god to be worshipped by all the Jews. Daniel finally hears one angel ask another, how long is this desolation of the sanctuary going to last? In other words, how, how long is, are, are we going to have to put up with this guy that has just ruined everything? Verse 14, and he said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be restored to its rightful state. The number may refer to the regular sacrifices which were offered every evening and morning, so 2,300 sacrifices divided by two per day would be 1,150 days, a little over three years. That's how long the angel says the little horn will keep you from doing your sacrifices. It was a terrible time in Jewish history. And pretty much to the day, though, y'all, just as the angel revealed, Antiochus' reign of terror came to an end. That's a great story in and of itself. Go look it up. It's fantastic. Ladies, here's the big picture. Antiochus Epiphanes was an evil man, but he is just a foreshadowing of it. He is a type of the ultimate evil one who is to come in Antichrist, who will come in the end times. Even though much of what Daniel sees matches Antiochus Epiphanes to a T. I mean, you can go through and just match it up word for word with history. Some of what Daniel sees here obviously does not match up with Antiochus. It has to be pointing at someone who will come 
further down the line, someone who will be more powerful, more evil, and that is, of course, Antichrist. An example of what is to come is found in verse 25. Daniel says, it, he, and he, the little horn, shall even rise up against the prince of princes, who is Jesus, and he shall be broken, but not by human hand. Antiochus didn't rise up against Jesus. Jesus wasn't even born yet. But we do know from reading Revelation that Antichrist will rise up against Jesus, right? However, the big picture, he will um, be broken and suffer ultimate judgment from the very hand of God. This is a perfect example of that double fulfillment and that double prophecy in Scripture. Antiochus is the near fulfillment, but Antichrist is the long term, and we will see that in the future. Now, y'all want to see really, something really cool, and I'm running out of time. I'm sorry, but this is, this is so cool. In the book of Matthew, Jesus is talking about signs that we need to be looking for uh, when the end times are coming close. And he refers back to this exact passage from Daniel. Let's look, Matthew 24, 15. Jesus says, so when you see the abomination of desolation, that is because the Antichrist is going to do exactly what Antiochus did in the, in the sanctuary, in the end times. He says, so when you see this abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, and Jesus says, let the reader understand. And the next sentence is, run. Okay? Flee. Get out. Jesus is warning us to look for the signs, to be aware, to know your scriptures. Know what the truth of the scriptures say. He's saying study the past so that you'll recognize the evil as it stands in front of you. But ladies, here's the big picture. Antiochus was defeated and Antichrist will be defeated. Praise God, right? These are tough passages today. Scripture tells us that there are some very, very dark days ahead. And we need to be prepared to face them. And it can be easy for us to read these passages and become overwhelmed and terrified and to lose hope. But if God was sovereign in the kingdom of Babylon, and he was sovereign in the kingdom of Persia, and he was so sovereign in the kingdom of Greece, and he was sovereign in the kingdom of ancient Rome, don't you think he's going to be sovereign in the kingdom of the revised Rome? Yes, take it to the bank. He still sits on the throne. So I would encourage you to study, study, study. But don't go so deep into the weeds that you lose your hope. Take a step back every now and then. And take a look at the big picture. And listen to what the angel, how, where the angel directed Daniel. And that is to the glory that will come. Despite all the disturbing and alarming details of our text today, never, ever, ever forget to, to look at the big picture. Take a step back. Look at the big picture. God is in control of history and he wins and therefore so do we. Will you trust that God is in control of all things as his story is revealed through history? Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for these complicated texts that show us the big picture. You sit on the throne. You always have. You always will forever and ever. Amen. Have a great week.